Yeah, so Yal Kang, Director at uh, Shrinker Digital, has been an e-business and telecoms expert uh, with an in-depth knowledge of communications, networks and infrastructure. Uh, Yal has worked with shortage skill occupations and gained experience with barrier to work from both a physical and a cultural perspective, including those first working uh, as an international recruiter. In the last five years, Yal has been working on a project very close to his heart with his brother and close friends, named with that of providing solutions to organisations of many varying sectors to communicate more effectively with their audience. This has involved countless R&D developments and liaising with a variety of public and private sector organisations. And I'm going to hand over to Yal now to take us deeper on his journey. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Thank God, that's the right journey across town to find a connection that works. Uh, well, well, thank you all for uh, inviting me, basically, to come and speak. Um, uh, I suppose I should start with a bit of a background on Shrinker. We, we started uh, in 2017 uh, as a content creation house, and a friend of ours told us about this NHS digital plan to digitise all leaflets and information and put them onto places like social media and getting them out to the public rather than them having to go to surgeries and so on and so forth. That was also going to help them with their sustainability plan, which all organisations have, a reduction of paper, energy and water by 50%. So, like I say, in 2017, we we started digitising their, their, their content. Today, that's very common. So today you go onto Facebook, Instagram or whatever, and you are going to have digitised versions of a lot of content. Um, it, it did not exist at the time, which is which is strange to actually say. So what that helped people do was it helped them connect to younger audiences on Instagram. Um, it, 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 it helped them connect to people that weren't necessarily coming to the organisations themselves. We then moved on to work with the police in Leicester about hate crime because a very, very similar thing. Um, they were finding it hard to reach a certain demograph. So what we did, uh, we, we took their content, we basically made it so it worked across social media and started getting out that way. Towards the end, we realised that there was a gap missing, which was basically that it was great for the majority. The majority were getting information through no problem whatsoever in their own language. Which, you know, So we started looking at um, information that needed to get out to minorities and the hardest to reach. So working with the police, we did a specific uh, task, which was basically uh, getting their content, putting it into, into more engaging sort of ways and then adding language to it. So changing the language was a bit of a game changer because that's what was missing was people getting the same content, but in their languages so that they could connect to. Now, one of the issues that's come from actually doing that is even after doing all the demo work and after doing all of the um, you know, the, the trials and the, and the statistics is convincing communications teams, or organizations that they can do this. Um, we're quite a small company, obviously, and uh, we can only deal with so much. So, so that's been one of our one of our biggest issues. And so, what I'm really here to speak about is basically, well, how does it work? What do you do? It's it isn't it isn't uh, rocket rocket science, really. What we what we do is we take the existing content that the providers provide, so whether it's the police, the NHS, the fire service, whoever. We then take that content and we translate it into up to 44 languages. We change the aspect ratios to make sure that it works on things like um, Instagram, which is basically a square based, Facebook, which is landscape, and TikTok and things like that, which are more portrait styles. Um, once you've done that, you then basically have to uh, make sure that the actual size of the thing is small enough so that if somebody then decides to share it, they don't get caught up on something called data poverty. So basically, you know, if, if we've got a if we've got a data plan and we've only got a few gigabytes, you don't want, you know, lots and lots of messages coming through that are very, very high data. So, so like I say, what we do is once we've created the actual content or done a version of it, so whether it's got sign language or whatever, we then need to get it out into the community. So how do we do that? We do that by using community champions mainly. So this is people in the Polish community, Romanian com community, wherever, that have access to basically influencers that's what they're known as so that's what we try and do so we try and make sure that we've got people that can get them get them into it um with the organizations themselves if it's something around hate crime with i don't know transgender things like that we then 
take the information and we give it to the LGBT centres and we give it to the community groups where these people are most likely to go and, you know, have contact with. We call them pinch points. So under COVID, uh, a very good example is, is that um, if somebody who's, say, a non-English speaker or someone that it doesn't really engage with public bodies, um, so someone who's not logging into the police to find out what the latest law is or someone who's not going to, to the NHS for the latest advice, we have to think about when they wake up, they may put on the radio. That's some information. They've got a phone in their hand, obviously. So we need to look at, are they connecting to WhatsApp groups? Are they connecting to Facebook groups? Are they part of any religious sort of institution or anything like that? So by giving the information out to the actual pinch points around the city where they could possibly be, um, we, we try and capture as many people as possible. We do it in such a way whereby we're actually statistically looking for how many people are connecting, how many people are engaging and whether these things work or not. And so one of the most beneficial things that we have here, especially in a place like Leicester, where the majority of our work has been done, um, is I'm just getting some technical help here. Because <laughs> I went into a bit of waffle mode there. Um, sorry, do you want me to mention something on it? OK, so one of the benefits that we have here in, in Leicester, especially, is, is and this is where nearly all of our trials have been, is it's 51 percent ethnic minority. We've got temples, we've got gudvaras, we've got churches, we've got community groups, we've, we've got everything. So it's quite easy for us to create the content in the different languages, give it to those institutions for them to play on their screens, to share on their Facebook, to share on their WhatsApp groups. And we do it in such a way whereby it's connected through a clickable PDF. Now, that's how we get our statistics back. We don't actually send them the video itself. We send them a link that they click onto that then takes them through to actually play the videos and so on and so forth. Uh, one of our coronavirus videos, by the way, which was put out in Punjabi, had 55,000 people engage with it. Now, that's a big number. But the reason there is that number is because they didn't have any other content in their languages that was sent to them. Now, I'm not talking about content that sits on a website because quite rightfully, the NHS, the police, everyone has translated information that does sit on their websites. The issue is getting someone to, first of all, connect to that website then navigate through and then find the information. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the information from where it is and get it out into the communities. So when we come to somewhere like Cumbria, which unfortunately doesn't have the kind of network of, you know, it's, it's quite dispersed, speaking to Saj and, you know, we know that basically that the communities are all, all over the shop. So basically you need one point of contact. We call it almost like a repository. So what happens is you get one institution that people are comfortable with, they can link to and organizations really then use that institution to give their information to so they create the content they pay for the content they get the translations done and they give it to this organization that organization then is a central point for communities to access people to access um and so there's not really a lot to it really you know if you think about it so the question was why why are we not able to connect with you know why doesn't public messaging work for the minorities? Why are they hesitant on taking vaccines? Um, and so, like I say, it comes back to the information is all there. We need to get the information out to people. And wherever the information is not tailored for communities, we need to tailor it for those communities. The cost of it really is negligible because unlike leaflets or anything else, you're only producing one. You only ever make one of these things and you need to get translated once. The fact that it gets shared is where the multiplication is happening. So it's not a cost issue. It really comes down to the ability of a team to do the, the majority work that they do. And I'm talking about communications teams here because they do a great job in actually getting information out to the majority of us. Um, we know more about COVID than any other disease. It's on the side of buses. It's wherever you walk into. Um, so what we're trying to do, like I say, is is give it a level playing field, take that same information in the same engaging way with the same moving graphics, so it looks exactly the same, with the same authority badges on, which is very important that the authority badges are on there so that people know that it's come from a genuine source, because obviously things like phishing and phishing adverts, uh, we know people that basically were sent out messages in their languages saying, click on here, pay this money for a COVID test. And we know that the COVID tests were free. The reason for that was because when you look at mainstream uh, media, and mainstream messaging, yeah, they spend a lot of money on it. I mean, it really is high, high content. But as soon as they go for anyone else, they'll give them a, a Word document, a PDF, whatever, something for them to print off. So 
All of this, by the way, is something that we did for a good couple of years and we really didn't get anywhere. We weren't able to convince anyone that this was something worth pursuing. Uh, we weren't able to get in with, apart from a few institutions that actually worked with us, um, the rest really just didn't get it. They weren't interested. So what we've done in recent years is we've moved the conversation slightly to, remember when I mentioned data poverty and keeping file sizes very small? Well, that also reflects onto the climate because the larger a data file is, the more energy it consumes, um, basically a megabyte and, uh, and CO2, they're closely related. So we actually found out that what we were able to do was by compressing um, the actual content itself, we were able to make sure that campaigns didn't have a big CO2 uh, output. And that's really where our sh focus has gone on to, because if the world goes the way that we want it to, which is translating things into 44 different languages and putting out those over the internet, well, you're increasing the digital carbon footprint by 44. So we're hoping that basically through using the planet as a reason to actually do very, very, you know, engaging social content about, you know, you know, anything drugs or hate crime or whatever it might be, um, that we're not actually harming the planet by doing that. And so sustainability, um, equality of message, um, they go hand in hand for us. And that's what we do as an organisation. I'm not entirely sure how much of this basically is helping people. Um, but uh, but certainly, if anyone would like to ask me any questions about what I've just said, that would be uh, probably the easiest way to do it. I'd rather answer questions about maybe where they're struggling to engage with people. Make up a question. <laughs> <laughs> If there are any questions again, if you could raise your, your virtual hand, then we'll look to, to unmute you uh, and invite you in there. If that's okay, everyone. By the way, you know, you know, when we talk about accessing information and barriers towards information, it's not just basically a BME or a different language or whatever, because I understand that sometimes people will say, well, there's only a couple of people here that speak that language. Why would you do it for them? But barriers towards information means sign language. It means people that basically have very poor vision, uh, people that basically that are blind that need to basically hear braille whatever whatever it might be i think that i think in this day and age for us not to be able to get information out to everyone in society considering that we have digital um it's been great but like i say first of all someone's gonna have a device to be able to you know you know get that on they've got to have wi-fi they've got to have this and that so like i say it's just, i don't know what the appetite is out there within i mean all of you do brilliant work and the people that, that, that the work is aimed at uh, generally are the minorities within society is it actually getting through to them are you able to engage with them to say this is what we're doing for you and get their feedback into it and often the answer is no because you're just not engaging with them so like I say once we set up a, a channel of communication with people for instance in Dagenham and Barking through the NHS who are brilliant there by the way um, a friend of mine actually runs it and so unfortunately you have to come back to friends you know what I mean but what he's managed to do is get get vaccine videos out there in multiple languages um, and in their borough, the uptake went up compared to all the other boroughs that did not do it. So statistically, we've got the feedback to, to tell us that it works. Uh, like I told you earlier, that one of our coronavirus posts was viewed by 55,000 people, Punjabi people. There's barely 300,000 Punjabi people in the whole country. So it's a pretty good number. But once you've got their ear, the idea is, is that that's a resource for them. So you should punch, push anything through there. So again, what I would say, my recommendations would be this, is that you need a local champion. You need someone like the MCC or SAG. They basically set up WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, Instagram pages, and then the institutions around there should give their content to them to then get through to the people. If someone's going to engage with it because they're going to click on it and they're going to come back through to your website. But when they come through to your website, make sure that the link they click on is through to that specific page in the same language. So I don't know how many communications people are out there speaking, but every time we've had a meeting with anyone there, they've said the same things or up and down the country. We don't work that way. They don't engage with us. Um, we can't make multiple language content. I'm, I'm reading them off here because someone's bothered to actually write down all the reasons that we've had back. We've got this under control is a brilliant one. We can do this and we will do this. A year later, bugger all. And then they start crying about, oh, people aren't engaging with us, the communities, they're not listening to us, they're not taking the vaccine. You go, because you've never spoken to them. 
you've never sent them one message in your whole life. You've never engaged with them. So how do you expect them now? And I'll give you another great example. People say people come into this country, they should conform to this country. They should do the, what's done in this country. When you go on holiday to Spain, do you automatically start watching the TV, reading the news? No, you link back to the country where you're from to get it from. So again, you see, uh, you cannot blame people for um, doing what they've always done. And it's institutions that need to change. If they want people to conform and they want to, so workplaces are a massive one. Workplaces, you sat there all day and you've got screens up there. Marks and Spencer are the only ones who took our vaccine hesitancy videos because they knew that their workforce was diverse within those warehouses and they put them up on the screens and they continuously played through on the loop. They shared them on their Facebook, they shared them on their Instagram. So you could learn a lot from us, obviously, as institutions, but anyone who's trying to engage with any kind of community, like I say, it's um, get, the, get it set up first, get the foundations right and everything else will follow. And uh, I really don't know what else to say on this, <laughs> honestly. Uh, it, it, hopefully that made some some sense. It's, it's basic. It did make sense, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to come in with a question, actually, if that's mm. all right. So obviously on yeah. the, the back of the success of the, the COVID mission has been released, with those organisations or, or areas that you've been working with, has there been any sort of next steps in terms of, right, we've seen the success here, it's backed up by the statistics, this is what we want to go on to next, rather than just being COVID-focused. I just wonder if there's any developments there that you'll be able to share today. Unfortunately, what's what's actually happened is, is that as soon as the, when, when COVID first struck, we made 14 different language videos. Um, we made them in every single aspect ratio. We, we contacted all the major organisations and said, we need your badges. Uh, so we've got the police, the NHS, everyone, local council. We did it all for free. We gave it to them. We gave it out. We ended up on BBC and ITV. The mayor came out and said, wow, brilliant. You saved the city. Um, they then asked us to do basically more. But then Leicester went into lockdown and the, and the Conservatives came in and they shut down everything. They shut down Leicester being able to actually do anything of their own. They said they're going to bring their own teams in. So NHS England came and spoke to us and said, look, this work you've been doing is brilliant. Can you explain it to us? We explained it to them and they said, right, we're going to do it. We're going to copy your, what's it called? And then they sort of did it, but they didn't do it. They didn't follow the processes. Like I said, community champions, getting it out there. Get that, that, that. So really, no, the answer is that they they didn't. And I, I I think most people struggle with this. Anyone who had any sort of influence over doing anything, they found that once it was in the news that um, I don't want to say they gave it to their mates. I don't want to say that, but they take it in 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 house because that's the only job they had to do. So, no, unfortunately, we didn't. And we had a real terrible incident here in Leicester, whereby the police officers themselves had lent their voices to speaking in Polish or whatever and all that kind of stuff and then it, it was blocked because they said that unless we did it for every single language we would be discriminating against certain people so they won't do it and I didn't understand that because you doing it in English every day discriminates against nearly everyone so look you know without naming names <clears throat> the communications head at Leicestershire Police is an idiot but basically the the, the thing is the, the, there's there's certain people who've taken it upon themselves who are not from those minorities I've sat at home whilst Boris Johnson has been on TV and my mum said to me, what is that bloke saying? And I've had to say, he is telling you this. I could have been telling her anything. I really could have been telling her anything. And, uh, you know, you know, can I just make a point on that? You know why, why this is very close to my heart is because the one thing that I know about, um, especially domestic abuse, is 80% of the people who suffer domestic abuse are non-English speaking people. And the, and the abusers themselves are people who don't understand the law. Now, how do you know what the law is? You're sat here. How do you know what the law is? And, and if you think about it, you don't really, do you? So you come into the country. Shouldn't it be down to the police to send out messages saying you cannot hit someone? If you hit someone, it's a crime. If you do this, it's a crime. You could lose your job. You could do that. Put it in multiple languages and get it out to the perpetrator. So at least the perpetrator knows, look, it might have been all right where I was from. I can't do it here. So the victim and the perpetrator both need messaging from the police. But the police tell us that they don't do that. It's down to domestic abuse groups and people like that to actually do it. When we write to the domestic abuse groups and saying you need to tell people the law in their languages, they say it's the police's job. So what happens there is, is that no one is listening to people who are actually telling them to simply do this step. Because if you have people standing on the grass and you go, hey, what are you doing on the grass? And they go, well, oh, I don't speak the language, mate. You go, couldn't you read the sign? No, I couldn't read the sign. I'm stood on the grass, right? So you can't. And, and then what happens is, is that gives 
um, the people a bad name because community is a bad name. They don't conform. They don't do this. They weren't told. They weren't educated. So uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but we've tried pretty much everything. We, we wrote to the government. They put us on the Crown commercial list. So we are a supplier, one of six media companies that apparently supply the government with media. Um, but it doesn't mean anything. If we write to a council, if we write to institutions, they say we've got our own comms teams. We don't need you. And you go, you do for what we're doing. So it's not legislation. It's not part of law. Uh, the UN do have a, I mean, I sent you a PDF that said the, you know, um, every human has the right to information. It's a basic human right. And it's law in 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 some countries, not in this country. And like with most things, we we don't even have a law on, you know, data isn't even considered um, polluting. And we know that the Internet is basically the biggest polluting engine on the planet. We all we all basically use the Internet. We're using it right now. It's being run off energy right now. So there's a lot of things that need to change, whether they'll change to make our company any money, God knows, I doubt it. So we've, we've moved into, uh, like I say, we've moved into basically consulting people about data and data poverty. But uh, but do you find, can I ask you guys a question? I mean, you're into diversity and you guys have to connect with um, communities. What struggles do you have to connect with communities? Do you find that basically that you are connecting with them? Um, yeah, so we, we to be quite open obviously we, 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 we've said at the start and Brian mentioned we're quite open we want to do more we need to do more um, and sometimes a lot of our methods are similar to what you kind of outlined at the beginning so that connection with multicultural Cumbria and with other local groups where there is a trusted source a trusted person trusted individuals trusted organization we've got those connections in place already that's been something we've had great success from in the past um, but I'm by no way I means thinking you know we've completed that sort of speaking and we need to do more and we continue to do that and that's one of the reasons why we've got a, a memorandum of understanding alongside Sarge and the team of Cultural Cumbria factored into that MOU without going too granular with it is, is issues around language and terminology which we will be working on in the near future as well um, but yeah it, it kind of what you outlined before just kind of resonated with that because it's about that interaction through those trusted sources and community groups and it's something that you know to speak from about the university it's something we want to and we'll be looking to do further down the line as well and in more depth so it's yeah it's it's a very it resonates on a personal and professional with me what you've been saying sure. I'm, I'm glad of that because you know one of the things we did we wrote to the fire service after Grandfell, um and we said to them that nearly everyone living in that building didn't speak english so shouldn't you be giving fire advice in other languages other than english where is it it's easy I could do it for you right now. I could basically take any of your advice, pay 35 quid to a translator, get it translated, give it to my team. They'll make all the aspect ratios and it'll be out there tomorrow. What's stopping people from doing it? Well, I'll tell you what's stopping them from doing it because they're not the ones in that situation. And that's simply what it is. And I'll tell you what, it really does. It, it irks me. It actually, it hurts me to a point whereby it's almost a case of that people have forgot about the Commonwealth. People have forgotten about the reasons that came here. They're invited to come here. And basically, you invite people to come here and you allow them in. I, I did visa work basically for five years. And as you know, um, I was a shortage skills specialist. I've worked with pe people with disabilities. I've helped ex-offenders back into work. I've done all that. I've worked with shortage skills abroad. And I've also been an, uh, an IT consultant. And so I know what I'm on about. But the problem is I'm speaking to people who just don't. And I don't know how they even got the jobs. And I'm disgusted by the fact that when I speak to them, if I have a go at them, they just shut off. They don't want to engage in the debate. But the simple truth is there's nothing that cannot be done tomorrow. And en anyone on here listening from the police, from the fire service, from anywhere that has a job to connect with communities, if you're not able to do it, contact Sad or contact me. We'll do it for free. And when I say free, just to show you, I mean, basically, and you can't say any better than that, can you? Sad, how are you anyway? Are you all right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, everything's got. It's fabulous to actually hear what you're talking about and what you're saying because I've heard it, um, and it, I'm still so passionate about how we get communication teams when we are trying to explain about the need for translations and sharing information. We sort of go through three main levels, and at any one point when it stops, everything just stops, and it's just so difficult because. The need is there to reach 
people um, from all different backgrounds speaking different languages and it's like what you were saying where oh well we can't translate into over 70 languages so uh, um, you just have what we've got and there you go and just share it on your social media but it's it's not effective and that's what's been so difficult to try and explain is that there has to be a format to it otherwise you're just chucking information out but you, they can already in a way get that when they're sending it out and we have to be much more focused mm. and then the the reasoning behind it is like well there's not enough followers on there there's not enough followers in there and actually the amount when we're putting posts out we'll see how many people have seen it they haven't liked it but they've seen it mm. and you know that message is getting actually across but I think there's this constant excuse that we're not really that diverse still and how do we make it effective and how yeah. it ends up being too expensive. Um, and it's just really frustrating because you know how that, can you reach people? You know, with that size, they spent £350 million pound on COVID information. All of us know more about COVID than any other disease ever. It was in our faces constantly. Do you know how much they spent on basically people who weren't the majority? Bugger all as well as I can see. I mean, nothing. I mean, literally nada. We did it for free. Uh, I mean, when we went on TV, I wish I'd said that to them. I was going, yeah, none of these sods paid us. None of them paid us. Because they didn't have the budget for it. They kept on saying, however, they spent £60,000 in this city alone in Leicester in sending letters out to the BME households. That information was out of date within days. The information changed. So what they should have done is put a QR code on there and said, look, why don't you link onto this for the latest information? Even on bus shelters, when I see a poster without a QR code, it's laziness. But I know what it is. Uh, we basically, the communications teams I'm speaking to are old. They've been there a long, long time. There's no young blood. It's all basically, it's all basically foot. It's, and that annoys me because what it is is that they're just supposed to basically i mean keep up with the times they don't keep up with the times there's, there's no training for them i don't blame them as, essentially but they're not going to let us go in and, and uh, train people so sad it comes down to you being in the community us doing what we always do is take their information compress it because it's always too large as well that's the other thing that always annoys me they make it so big if a million people are going to share a file that's 140 megabytes, let me just give you an idea. One kilobyte shared by two million people is five flights to Amsterdam. Most of, the, most of these files that we see, videos we see online, are over 100 megabytes. We get them down to about 10 megabytes. So the 90 megabytes we're taking off is huge savings for the planet as well. So if they're not even considering it at that level, I understand putting it into different languages is a million miles away. So sad, it really does come down to, like I say, is you need to and i've explained this before is you need to be a central point for the fire service for the police for the nhs to get their multi-language information give it to you then you get out to the communities and say don't worry you don't have to because people are afraid to access you know government sites and all that kind of stuff so you need to go to them they've got the information they've already made it we, we discussed this before they have made it and doctors of the world brilliant organization have translated everything into 44 different languages but what you've got to do is link to them make the link easy so um but so look, 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 there is a roadmap the great the good news is that something can be done about it we just need someone to stick their head above the parapet and say you know what i'm going to actually do something about this i am actually going to be the and the first person who does it will in my eyes be a, a trendsetter groundbreaker so if there is someone on here that runs a communications department that wants to trial or do something let's do it let's not talk about these things anymore Fabulous. Thank you. I can okay. just see as well, uh, yeah, when you when you come off uh, from your section, there is somebody dropped the, the contact details in the chat as well to connect with you uh, in regards to the further down the line. So that, that's Thank fantastic you. straight away. Um, but yeah, if there's no more questions, I think we'll, we'll draw that session to a close and really, you know, thank you for everything. Your perseverance this morning to join us as well. Not, not yeah, lost on us. So, so <laughs> I really do appreciate that. But no, that's fantastic. Um, and what I'll look to do then now is, uh, is just move the session on to our, our next speaker, if that's all right. So thank you very much for your time, Joe. That's no problem. You know, can I just say, and last thing, anyone who wants any information on what I've spoke about, shrinkadigital.com. The first page is about carbon reduction, but there's case studies about equality of message later on. And you can see the work we've already done and everything's on there. So please, shrinkadigital.com, go have a look. Okay. And well done, guys. Well done for organising the event. Thank you, Saj. Thank you. Take care.